wouldn't it be really cool if we could get to that spot where we can, uh, where we can say that it's well with my soul? Um, you know, I was thinking like politically, like we're in the middle of an election right now, and I think the most important issue that the government faces um, is one that's not really being addressed. I think it's uh, the national debt that we're accumulating. Um, it's almost twenty uh, trillion dollars at this point. Now. I think this is unethical. I think it's unethical for one generation to uh, borrow money from our children. I don't think that's the way it should play out. Um, it's going to create all sorts of problems for us. Um, we're going to keep having to pay back more and more and more interest so we can spend money, uh, less money on the things that we really need. Um, now, if I were to run for president this year, and I, oddly enough, I would actually be a very viable candidate this year. Um, <laughs> But if I were to run for president, and this were my, um, if this were my primary issue, um, I guarantee you I would lose. Because this issue is not going to get any votes. Um, nobody wants to talk about this. You don't want to talk about changing the way the government works. Um, you know, less services for sure, probably more taxes. Um, okay, hey, I'm running for president. Uh, less services, more taxes. We're going to get this debt paid off. Come vote for me. Um, that's going to be a very tough sell, isn't it? Now, you know it's right, you know it's ethical, you know like long term it is uh, for the good. Um, you know, this morning I'm going to talk about an issue just like this, like you know it's right, you know it's ethical, you know it's moral, you know it's good. Yeah, when I think I get done talking in about 25 minutes, um, I don't think I'm going to get many votes because uh, what I'm going to talk about this morning is uh, Sabbath. And Sabbath, uh, its adversaries are not Trump and Clinton. Sabbath's adversaries um, have some other names. You know, we're believing, we're programmed uh, as a kid to, to believe certain things. You know, we're programmed to believe that we are what we do. Therefore, the more we do and the better we do, the more we are. Yeah, we're programmed um, to believe that if we're not busy, we're not important. You know, that our worth somehow is tied to how many people want, uh, you know, this much of our time. We're programmed to believe that more is better. That somehow, somewhere, someone along the line said, yeah, yeah, bigger is better, more is better, um, newer is better. And I think that some of us are probably even saying something like this. Okay, I'm going to get to that God thing eventually. Um, I do know that God is up to something. I'm going to eventually figure that out. But right now, um, I'm going to do more. Therefore, I'm going to be more, and I'm going to have more, and I'm going to, uh, at that point, I am more. Now, um, that is Sabbath's adversaries right there. Um, now I'm going to give you an example of what Sabbath uh, looked like for one man. His name was uh, Eric Lydell. Eric Lydell lived uh, 100 years ago. Um, some of you actually know who he is, right? Um, during his lifetime, he was one of the, if not the greatest athlete in the world. If he were alive today, his name would be Usain Bolt. He was the fastest man in the world. Uh, he was born, he was a preacher's kid, um, so he had that going for him. I mean, he, he picked the right parents. He had, he's a preacher's kid. And uh, he was born in China. His parents were uh, missionaries. Um, they were Scottish, but they lived in China. When he was six or seven years old, um, it was very common for uh, missionary kids uh, who had their parents overseas to come back and study at a, a missionary school in London. So it was a boarding school. This is pretty much where he grew up. And they discovered quickly, like, this guy was good. You know, he was, he was the best rugby player. He was the best cricket player. He was very smart as well. And uh, even the headmaster of his school later said, like, this kid, he, he was so humble. He was so good at everything he did. But uh, there was not an ounce of vanity within him. You know, he was smart enough. He got into Oxford. He studied there. Uh, he joined the track team. You know, it was here that they discovered that he was the fastest man in the world. Um, the time came for the Olympics uh, in 1924 in Paris. Um, and he was the odds-on favorite, just like Usain Bolt, to win the 100 meters. But the problem was is, uh, he was devoutly religious. And he observed this thing called the Sabbath. And it was like the heat of, I think, like the second round was scheduled on a Sunday, and he wouldn't run because that was a day off for him. He believed that. He practiced it. Now, um, 
the British officials, they weren't happy about this. Uh, they wanted him to run because they knew that there's a very good chance that he was going to win a gold medal. Um, it was going to bring pride to their country. So we're going to watch a little bit of a movie made about Eric Liddell back in 1981 called Chariots of Fire. And we're going to uh, hear um, how he decided if he was going to run this 100-meter uh, race or not in the 1924 Olympics. So he actually did not run. Um, that year, he was not crowned the world's fastest human being. Now, he did train for another race. Uh, he didn't like to do it. He was a sprinter. He just liked the 100 meters. But uh, the 400 meters worked out for his schedule. He trained for this lap that's like three times as, the race is like three times as long as the one that he's going to do. So he ran the 400 meters, went through the heats, and uh, he ended up winning the gold medal. Not only did he win the gold medal, he uh, demolished the world record in the process. That world record lasted for 12 years. Now, um, he says that uh, he died, actually, in 1945. Uh, he became a missionary to China. That part of China was occupied by Japan. He died in a, uh, basically like a concentration camp. But he said um, later in life um, that the most important thing that he got from that Olympics was not a gold medal. Uh, it was not a world record. The most important thing is that he did not compromise uh, what he believed. Now, you guys are thinking, okay, um, I still don't got your vote. I know I don't. Um, you're thinking, okay, that was 100 years ago. You know, times have changed. Okay, well, let's, let's do that. So I want you to do something after church, all right? I want you to go to Chick-fil-A and have lunch. It's on me. I'll buy it, all right? <laughs> you're not going to get it because it's closed. You know, a long time ago, Truett Cathy said, um, I don't care. Like, we're not going to make our employees work on Sunday. We're going to save a day for the Lord and uh, his purposes and his work. And he also said, you know, I tried the seven-day-a-week thing. It's not working out. I, I, I can't expect people to do what I can't do. So he saved this day for the Lord and the Lord's purposes. Now, I don't know if you know this about Chick-fil-A. Um, of all the fast food restaurants, per store, it is the top performing restaurant in the country. Each store does $2.7 million of sales per year. The next closest is McDonald's at $2.3 million of sales per year. Now, someone asked True Kathy, like, you know, what about this lost revenue? I mean, is it a big deal? And he actually believed that he wasn't losing any revenue because uh, uh, he was living out the Lord's purposes. Now, even if he did lose revenue, he said, like, I've learned early in life. And he quoted Jesus. It was this, uh, the verse that John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, spoke more than any other verse. You know, True Kathy quoted Jesus when he said, what does it profit to gain the entire world and yet forfeit your soul? Is there anything that's worth more than your soul? So we're going to look at what Sabbath is. Um, I just want to be really clear about what it is, and I want to be clear about what it's not. So number one is uh, Sabbath is a gift. Now, Sabbath is going to be God's gift to us. So if I were to take a poll of, uh, uh, if I were to take a poll around this room of, like adjectives that you would describe yourself with. I think the words that I would come up with would be like stressed out, distracted, tired, uh, busy. Some of you would actually say those words, right? Like if I ask you to describe yourself, you would say words like that. Now, um, every once in a while, I'll even hear someone say, gosh, you know, but I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'm like, seriously? Like, tired and busy and stressed out and distracted, like this is your plan for your life. Now what Sabbath does, it's a gift that offers us um, a, a different reality. It will do that. The world will give us these things. Sabbath, it gives us priorities for our busyness, rest for our fatigue, peace for our stress, and focus for our distraction. Just put those things in two columns. The world gives us busyness and fatigue and distress and uh, uh, distraction. Sabbath will give us priorities and, and focus and peace and rest. Now, the next thing that Sabbath is, uh, Sabbath is going to uh, recreate us into God's image. Sabbath is going to uh, recreate us into God's image. Now, uh, you are created in God's image. Um, you know, I baptized uh, the little girl a little bit ago. Um, she was created in God's image three years ago. Every single one of us was created in God's image as well. Now, every single one of us has fallen from that image. 
you know, we've gotten involved in things we shouldn't have gotten involved in, and we've made poor choices, and we've gotten away from that image, and, you know, so you have beautiful, you have not so beautiful, and then it's beautiful again when we can be restored into God's image, and we can do this. I can do this. You can do this. Now, let's look at uh, how this works in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. So one of the things that we know about God's image is that God takes time to rest. You know, we can look at all the things about God's image. We know that God is generous. And when we're restored to that image, we're generous people as well. We know that God forgives. And when we're restored to God's image, then we forgive. We know that the Bible tells us that that God is patient and kind. And when we're restored to God's image, we're patient and we're kind. We know that uh, God is a servant. And when we're restored to his image, we're a servant as well. Now here, the Bible tells us that God rested. And when we're restored to God's image, we find time in our life to rest, to be rejuvenated, to be restored, to re-enter the world as stronger, more well-balanced people. So Sabbath, um, the next one I want us to think about is Sabbath is not how we earn God's love. And this one's going to be important for so many of us. Um, Sabbath is not how we earn God's love. Sabbath is a demonstration of God's love. Now the absolute last thing that I want for any of you to get out of this is, okay, I've got to take time away from my busy life so that I can reconnect to God. And this is another thing that I'm going to put on this long, ridiculous to-do list that I have to do to earn God's love. Now, you're not going to earn God's love by uh, keeping the Sabbath. Um, You've already been approved. You've already received God's love. God already loves you. There's nothing that you can do about that. Um, I want to look at the gospel now, the gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse uh, 27. Here the Bible says, then Jesus said to them, so now Jesus is speaking. Jesus is coming through. He's just getting started. He's interpreting the Old Testament scriptures, uh, specifically um, you know, early on the law, the Ten Commandments. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath, now here's why the Sabbath was created. The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. I don't want you to leave here feeling like a failure, that you have not been successful at this up to this point in your life. You know, I don't want you to feel guilty that the schedule is so full that there's been no time for rest and reflection. The Sabbath was made to meet your needs. Now, let me explain it this way. Like, um, I have two sons. Uh, I have a 15-year-old and a a 9-year-old. Now, they've done some really cool things um, in their short time period. You know, they've scored goals in soccer games. They've, uh, you know, won debate tournaments. They've gotten A's on their report cards. Now, they've also done some not-so-cool things. Um, they've spilled some juice on a computer. They've lost things, and they don't always listen. Now, on both these things, like, guess what? The really cool things, it does not make me love them anymore. The really bad things, it does not make me love them any less. My love for them has absolutely nothing to do with their performance. You see, my love for them when I I, it started when um, it started when I uh, I saw a picture. You know, it was a a picture of a a baby inside a mom. Yeah, I looked at this picture and it was love. Yeah, I remember holding them the day they were born. I remember watching them take their first steps. I remember uh, listening to them speak their first words. I remember like bringing them home from a hospital and uh, looking over the top of their little crib and watching them sleep. God gave me my love for them. There's nothing they can do to lose it. There's nothing they can do to earn it. They're my sons, and I love them. Now, there's a perfect heavenly father that is much more loving than this imperfect uh, earthly father. God's love for you does not depend upon 
your faithfulness to the law, nor are you going to lose it if uh, you mess up. God's love for you comes because you are his, and you are his alone. Now, God wants a better life for us. And we can't just, like, stop and say, okay, well, God loves me. I can do whatever. God wants a better life for us. He doesn't want the distracted. He doesn't want the tired. He doesn't want the the busy. He doesn't want the overwhelmed. He doesn't want the overextended. You know, he wants the balance and the rested and the focused and the renewed. And that's why we have this thing called Sabbath. It's not how we earn God's love. It's how we receive God's love. God gives us Sabbath to rest, to renew, and then to re-enter the world. So the next thing about Sabbath, um, it's uh, not legalistic and dogmatic. Um, Sabbath is full of grace. You know, so I don't want you to think, okay, I can never ever work on a Sunday because the Bible says that, and if I do, I'm a sinner, I'm going to go to hell. Um, you know, we're going to look at what Jesus uh, says about that. Um, you know, it's important to know we don't live in ancient Israel. We don't live in 5000 BC. We don't live in 30 AD. We live in 2016 in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. So Jesus, he tells this story, or the Bible, actually, uh, Mark tells the story. Jesus is in it. Mark chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 1. Jesus went to the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, um, Jesus' enemies, they watched him closely. So these guys, they knew the law. They're the Pharisees. Um, They would have known the Hebrew scriptures like the back of their hand. They knew the Ten Commandments. They knew that, uh, you know, you shouldn't do anything on the Sabbath. That's the way they interpreted it. So they're keeping a close eye on Jesus, this new guy who says he's God, this guy that's healing people, he's teaching people, he's starting this great big movement. Um, If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. So the Bible continues, Jesus said to the man with a deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. So now at this point, everyone's looking like, this guy is saying he's God, he's healing all these people, he's teaching all these uh, people this and that. Um, is he going to do this? Is he really going to do this? Um, then he turned to the critics and he asked, um, for all you legalists out there, for all of you who follow this thing to a T, for all of you who demand perfection, um, I got a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? but they wouldn't answer him. He looked around at them angrily, and just this one little point, I want to stop and look here. Like, so anger is a natural emotion, okay? Jesus got angry. I mean, this is a natural emotion that he had, and Jesus was angry when he said this. Now, it's how we um, handle our anger is what's going to be essential. Um, there's a really, really bad way to handle anger, and there's a really, really good way to handle anger, and we're going to look at the good way right here. Um, He looked at them angrily and was uh, deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, so here was Jesus' response to the anger, "Um, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand, um, and it was restored. Now that's grace. You know, this guy comes to the synagogue with uh, a deformed hand. You know, maybe someone else comes with an addiction or a, a broken heart. And Jesus, he speaks a word. We hear a word from Jesus. And all of a sudden, um, our problems are greatly diminished, if not gone altogether. Now, the critics, they had this legalistic, dogmatic definition of a Sabbath. Nothing. No work. Devote the day to God. What Jesus did is he challenged their definition of devotion. Devotion to Jesus is not about dogma and legalism. It's about grace. So what we learn here is that people's Sabbaths are going to vary. You know, I'm thankful um, for doctors and nurses that work on Sunday in the ER or the hospital. We need that. Um, I'm thankful that there's uh, chefs and waiters that work in restaurants on Sundays. They serve us. You know, Pastor, I I work on Sunday. It's my busiest day of the week. you know, my Sabbath has to look a little bit different than yours. And, and that's cool because all of us are different. All of us are going to have this time of renewal, reflection, rest, and then re-entry into the world. That's going to be a little bit different for each of us. Eric Liddell, it worked for him. That's what he did. He just took a whole day off on Sunday, no exceptions. You know, many of us, it's, it's not going to quite work like that, but it has to happen. Now, one of the things that it has to happen is um, it's not going to happen on accident. 
in our culture, you're going to be, um, have you ever like had like a, a car with a steering wheel that's out of alignment and it kind of like pulls to one side of the road? Well, culture is always going to pull us to busyness and distraction, um, you know, being overwhelmed and stressed out. They didn't have like Twitter back when, you know, Jesus was telling these stories. Um, they didn't have cell phones or email or CNN or any of that sort of stuff. Um, so what Sabbath is going to be, um, is, is going to be that uncluttered time and space so we can distance ourselves from our own activities. Sabbath is going to be the time when we distance ourselves from our own activities and our own busyness enough so that we can experience what God is doing. So that we can experience uh, what God is doing. Now I'm going to tell you like how it can work for you because I think this is going to be the best way to experience Sabbath for most of us. Not all of us, but most of us. I believe that it has to happen daily. I believe that it has to happen weekly. And I believe that it has to happen yearly. I think for us to really enter into the deep waters of God's grace, um, it has to be planned. There has to be a time and a place that we say, you know, God, everything else is turned off all the distractions, the to-do list. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to focus on you and what you're trying to speak into my life. Now, um, for me, like one of the ways I do this uh, is, um, you know, daily, like, do, some of you have been around for a long time, and do you remember like when Benjamin was like in kindergarten or first grade or second grade, I'd always complain about the traffic line at the school? Like, I'd always have the, I mean, I would, like, get there, I'd be so stressed out, and, like, people wouldn't do what they were supposed to do, and it would, like, take a half hour to get your kid, and I'd leave, and I'd be all frustrated, and, like, he was, like, in second grade, and I said, you know, enough is enough. Um, you know, so I still do this to this day. I actually just get there early. Um, you know, some days, some days, uh, you know, it's with Benjamin, some days it's with David, and it doesn't happen every day, but I, I love to get there early, especially at uh, the high school. Um, Yes, you know, so I get there about like 2.55, 2.50, 3 o'clock sometimes, and I'm usually one of the first like five or six cars in line. What I do is I take out my iPad, I read some scripture. I is there a better place to pl pray than like right in front of a public high school? I love praying there. Um, you know, I just, uh, I, I tune out, I zone out, and if the kid's a few minutes late, no big deal, I'm with God, and if they come early, I'm with them, and I win either way. Like, you know, that works for me. Eric Liddell's, it, it worked for him. You have to find something that works for you. Now we're going to look at um, uh, how this looks like for us. So one of the things we do is we pray. Um, prayer is going to be part of your Sabbath. Can we go back to uh, Luke um, chapter 5, verse 16? Uh, we're going to look at what Jesus did during his Sabbath, all right? Um, but Jesus often, so let's just... Can you guys read that third word for me? What's it say? Okay, f let's try about more than 10%. Um, what's that third word? Often. Good, good. So how often did he do it? Often. Good. So Jesus, um, like fully human, fully God, um, how often did he get away to pray? Often. Good. So this is like a regular thing. He, uh, what, did he, what did he often do? He withdrew. He, I mean, Jesus, I mean, if you, if you think your life is busy, um, you know, try to stack it up to Jesus. Like, you know, this dude's like feeding 5,000 people. He's healing people. He's teaching people. He's training people. He's busy. He's getting from place A to place B, and he wasn't doing it in uh, Toyota Corolla. He was walking. Um, you know, so Jesus was busy, but he often withdrew um, to the wilderness, to like this quiet place uh, to pray. So Augustine, he tells us, um, that God has made us for himself, and our heart will be restless uh, until we can find rest in him. You know, so if we're looking for satisfaction out of youth sports or a promotion at work or a new floor in our house, um, your heart is going to be restless until you can find rest in the Lord. You know, so number one is uh, we pray. We find time to pray. You know, it can be when you wake up. It can be when you go to bed. Um, most of us get a lunch hour. It can be during that time. If you're a student, you have a study hall, you can do it then. But find a time. Uh, find a time um, you can experience the rhythms of God's grace through prayer. 
And number two is uh, silence. So when's the last time you've like really experienced silence? And I'm not just talking about like the lack of noise. I'm just talking like silence. Where it's just you and nobody else. Um, you sense that God was present, no noise. So you just experience like this thing called awkward silence. We're not always good at silence, are we? Well, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to hear God in the busyness. You're not going to hear God through all the noise and the clutter. You hear God in the silence and the quiet. Yeah, one of the things um, we did uh, on our sabbatical is um, we just went to a lake house. We go to the same lake house every, uh, every summer. And I have a favorite place at the lake house. It's the dock. I usually get up before everybody and go run in, and I jump in the lake to cool down, and I just sit on the dock, and it's, uh, it's silence. You know, it's a place for me that, that feeds my soul. Occasionally, I'll see a fish jump out of the water, or there will be a bird that flies across the skinny little part of the lake where the dock is. But it, it's like this wonderful time of renewal, and I would say that we don't, only, don't even need to just find a time. We need to find a place a place where God can speak to us. Uh, Lamentations in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 26. The Bible says, So it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. We've got to find, in our world of noise, we've got to find this place of silence. Now the next thing we're going to do during our Sabbath um, is rest. We've got to find this time to rest. Like, uh, um, Kierkegaard, I think he said something like, far from idleness being um, evil, he said idleness is the one true good. You know, we can't, we can't just walk, I mean, so listen to the language that we use in our culture. If we don't have rest, what do we have? We have burnout. Have you ever, guys ever heard that where you get burned out because you're not resting? Like, we've got to try to find time to rest. One of the things that, um, I mean, so say if you're See if like, you have this most emotionally like, challenging job. You need to find rest for your mind. So maybe what you need to do is find some buddies and go play golf or find some friends and, and, and play cards. Um, you know, maybe you have like, a really physically demanding job and rest to you is going to be a little bit different. You know, maybe you need to like, find a, a comfortable chair and surround yourself with some loved ones and you can laugh and spend the night that way. You know, rest, I mean, there's hundreds of us in this room right now and rest is going to look differently for, for many of us. Um, one of the things that we love to do at the lake, the boys and I, um, so this dock has like this platform. It's probably about the size of the stage or so. And have you, do you guys know what a battle royal is? It's like where you try to throw the other people off the dock, and like the last one on the dock uh, is like the winner. And I used to be like the biggest, strongest uh, person in our family. I'm not anymore. I'm just the biggest. Uh, you know, so the little guy is like Scrappy Doo, the big kid's like Scooby Doo, and like we just have this. I'm like Fred or whatever his name is. Like we just like throw each other in the lake and we wrestle some more. And like to me, that's rest. You know, it's physical activity, but it, it's rest. And you gotta find, um, you gotta find this place where you can rest. You know, burnout and stress, uh, waking up tired. It, it's not God's plan for your life. And the last thing, um, you know, you, you find your lake. Uh, the last thing is um, you gotta find your game, and that's to play. Um, you know, I was actually talking to a guy earlier about, you know, speaking at his uh, retirement thing next spring. Um, and what, what's really cool is, like, I, I've never talked to anyone, um, you know, at retirement or um, near the end of their life that says, you know, I just wish I would have worked more. Just didn't quite get all the things done that I wanted to do. But I have heard a lot of people say, you know, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids I would have spent some more time, you know, doing the things I love with the people I love. Basically, they're saying, you know, I, I wish I would have, I wish I would have played more. And I'm all for hard work. It's got its purpose, um, you know. But we can't work all the time. That's why God gives us this thing called Sabbath and and play. Is I mean, one of the things we do at the lake is uh, we have like a a clue and a monopoly game, and we play, and we play like until like there's a clear cut winner. 
Now, they're, they're, I mean, this is like cutthroat stuff. I mean, like, you know, Mr. Green killed, uh, you know, Mrs. Scarlet in the uh, office with the sledgehammer or whatever it was. I mean, you know, we do that thing. And, but, you know, it, it's renewing. We, and I'll tell you a story. Like, uh, I talked to the mom earlier this morning, but I went and saw a little guy in the hospital on, uh, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday night. It was after a meeting I had. And I took him um, one of those prayer blankets and I actually picked this one out myself. I was in the office. I picked it out. Uh, I picked the softest one for him because I just knew this kid would like a soft blanket. Um, I gave him this blanket, and he was so happy. And you know how this wor- works to play is that there's women in our church um, that make these blankets, and to them that's play. You know they love doing what they do. You know that's part of their Sabbath, and their Sabbath then becomes a blessing to others, and that's the way Sabbath works. Um, Jesus tells us to love God and to love others and to love ourself. And oftentimes we put the other thing, the last thing, uh, last. You know, he says that we should, we should love ourselves. Now, um, I still don't think I have a ton of votes, so I'm just going to say one more thing. Um, this is a matter of faith. It's a matter of trust. I know it's counterintuitive. Um, yeah, it may not be what you learned as a child, but this is a matter of faith. Yeah, I've talked about this before with money. Um, I believe it's true with time as well. Let's just say here's your Sabbath plan. 15 minutes a day, you know, three hours a week, three or four days a year. Like, let's just say that's where you start. And you can do that. Like, you have time for that. You're not too busy. I know people busier than you that pull that off. You know, so what you're saying is, God, I believe that when I give you this 15 minutes, um, that I can do more with your blessing the next 23 hours and 45 minutes and I can do 24 hours just grinding it out on my own. You know, God, I believe that after work on Wednesdays when I just go for a walk and I pray and I meditate and I reflect and I pray and I play, uh, I believe that I'll be able to do more the rest of the week with your blessing than I could on my own. You know, what Sabbath will do is it will uh, restore us it will rest us, it will help us reflect, and it will help us then re-enter the world as stronger and more focused and more balanced and more centered people. You need that, and the world needs that as well. You know, the disciples, they would have uh, observed Jesus uh, keeping the Sabbath. They would have been there when he said, guys, um, got to get away. Um, I'm going to go to the mountain, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to come back, and when I come back, we're going to go feed the people. We're going to heal the people. We're going to teach the people. So Jesus, he was uh, enjoying his last meal with them, and he took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and said, friends, this is my uh, body that is given for you. When you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. And likewise, Jesus, he uh, took the wine, he blessed it, and gave thanks, and said, friends, this is my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant that has been poured out for you and the forgiveness of your sins. When you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. So let us pray.